Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this presentation, Fuglari Besmanayan. My name is Rodrigo Martinez and I would like to share with you uh, some things that I think is, I found really amazing about the birds that you can find in Besmanaya. But first come first, I would like to thank the uh, Multicultural Center here of uh, Besman and also the library, Sapna House, for the support they have given me uh, in order to spread all these amazing things that we have in the air in Sila and that I would like to share with you. First of all, uh, believe it or not, but Best man is more than puffins. We have the biggest colony of puffins in the world. Almost a million birds are visiting us every summer. But believe it or not, we have many, many species in this island. It's not only about puffins. So we can just walk from the gardens to the cliffs, and we can see you can see a huge variety, a huge biodiversity of a lot of kind of different birds. Uh, why is that? Well, believe it or not, even though Heimae, the main island, and the other tiny island in this archipelago, uh, they hold a huge biodiversity. Uh, if you go to the garden, you're going to find a very specific kind of birds, like, for example, the starlings or even the snow buntings. If you go to the beach, you're going to find, for example, the tourstone, tildra, or the oyster catcher. Uh, the Aldur, uh, because these birds are specialized in finding small, um, small, uh, small bivalves, more mollusks, more small seafood, even worms that they are going to eat. That's why they have this long beak and these long legs, so they can just uh, step over the mat. If you go to the cliff, of course, you're going to find all these big guys, full mars, a lot of uh, a lot of seagulls, cormorants, for uh, good divers, kitty wakes, uh, the Sula for sure, the Northern Gannet, and Black Gillamot, and of course, Buffy. So I wanna walk with you guys with, uh, uh, through the island, through not all the birds, of course, because we have a long list of birds uh, here in the island. Uh, at least I can count at least 40 that you can see on a more or less regular basis. But don't worry, I'm not gonna go through all of them because it's not only about these 40, because we have many backgrounds, many migratory birds that are visiting us either in winter, in summer, in fall, in spring. Like for example, uh, two days ago, uh, Ruth Tholen, um, a very enthusiast uh, bird watcher, she found in her own garden a uh, chaffin, um, a bowfinka. That's my Icelandic is good. So that can give you a good proof that at any moment you can find very interesting birds. So I want to share with you just some of them so you can get to know them better. And maybe the next time you will go for a walk uh, to the golf course, even to buy bread at the bakery or to do some groceries and bonus to Cronan, you can find all these little clues of these little hidden secrets that we have around the island. As we have a multi-diverse uh, community here in Iceland, uh, especially here in Besman, I put all the names of the bird first in Icelandic, then in English, Polish, and Portuguese. And I want to start with this little guy, with the starling. Starling, that probably you are going to hear now the song, is a very noisy bird, making a lot of noises, and you can hear see them coming in huge flocks to the garden when they are looking for seeds. And they, they have what is called sexual dimorphism. So these photos that you see here, these three are all males. These two here in the left are the winter plumas. They don't look so colorful, but during the breeding time, which is going to be just in a couple of weeks, you're going to see them. They have this iridescent color that they use to attract the females. They are not using not only the colors, but also the sun. You hear the sun. This is what they are doing also to attract females. And that's one of the characteristics that, for example, attracts uh, a very famous composer. Probably you all know the famous composer Mozart. So Mozart apparently was uh, astonished by the song of the starlings in a pet store that he uh, walked through in Vienna. And he decided to purchase a starling. And the tale says that this starling helped him to create one of his piano concerto. Also, in this island, I realized that there are a few starlings with a ring. You see here this tiny little uh, gray ring, metal ring. That's how we can know where the bird has been. So if you see a starling and you get to read through a photo, or if you have very good eyes, the numbers, it will tell you exactly where this bird was banned in the first time. For example, this winter we have found a whooper swamp that was back back in UK 25, 20 years ago. So that can give you an idea how the birds are moving around Europe when they migrate. 
The next um, bird I want to share with you is the snow bunting. Snow buntings, these again are the males. They have this white coloration during the summertime when they are in the breeding season and they look a little bit more brownish during the, during the winter time. They are also very noisy bird and as well as the starlings, they are moving in big flocks. And what is interesting about this bird is that it's the, one of the few land-based birds that are breeding in the Arctic and they stay in the Arctic the entire year. Here in Iceland, in fact, we have one of the four subspecies that exist. Uh, it's called Lectropenax nivalis insulae, which pretty much mean uh, hoster spur from the snow from the island. There are these species that we can find in Iceland. You can also find it in Faroe Island or in Shetland. And as I say, they are also moving in big flocks and you can see that they are rolling over and over trying to find seeds. The next bird I want to share with you is a very popular one, a very important one in the Icelandic cultural list is the Eider duck. Ed. If you go now to the harbor, you are gonna see dozens of them because all of them are trying to attract the females. And what you're gonna see is uh, the males. Uh, they also have sexual dimorphism, of course, the males, they look more white uh, with this black band and a very interesting green pattern behind the head in the neck. And they are making these sounds, these uh, woos, if you like, that are very distinguishable for them. They also get a little bit red here in the chest when they are trying to, to mate. And usually they have like four or two, six ducklings. And of course, they have so many at the beginning of the season and so little at the end because there are a lot of predators that are trying to get all these little eider ducks. The eider ducks are doing really well here in Iceland. If you see this graph, uh, for example, it's uh, proved that from the 50s, the population has increased a little bit, um, but it is stayed more or less at, at a level that is more or less stable. They say that we are not losing population, something that is not happening in other countries uh, in Europe where we see a huge decrease in ducks and other related birds, uh, probably because of pollution, habitat destruction, and so on. Another very popular bird that you can see anywhere for the town, even if you go for a walk in the golf course, is the raven. Raven is also very linked with the, with the Icelandic tradition. And it's uh, because it was thanks to the raven that Iceland was kind of discovered. And I'm going to put it in quotation because this happened with Columbus. Columbus got the credit to discover America, but we are now now that he wasn't the first one in Iceland it happened this. But according to the tale, it was a guy called Flocky coming from Scandinavia and he heard of the tale of a, of a remote island in the middle of the North Atlantic with no inhabitant. So he decided to try to chase uh, this tail and try to see if he could get there. He convinced a few people and then they set sail towards Shetland, Scotland, and finally to Faroe Island. In Faroe Island, he took three ravens and after three days of sailing, he released the first one. And the first one came back to Faroe Island. So they were one minus raven. They kept sailing and they, uh, after a few days, they released the second raven. The second raven was all the time flying around the whole day around the vessel. And because he couldn't find any land, he returned to the vessel. A few days later, they try again. And finally, the third raven was released and he uh, flew straight to the north. So they followed to the north. And after a few days of sailing, they discovered what we know now as Iceland. So after that, Floki was called Rafna Floki in honor to the bird, Raf. Also, it's uh, very interesting that this uh, tale has been um, depicted in the famous series of Vikings uh, from the History Channel, when the famous character Floki set sail to Iceland, find Iceland, and of course, he takes the three ravens with him. Also, three the ravens is very linked with the Norse mythology. We have Hugin and Mugin, which were the raven of Odin, and were, they were meant to be the eyes and ears of Odin during the day so he could see everything. Also, ravens, they are feeding on everything. They are going to nest probably next to the cliffs. I think there are like two or three couples of this in the island. So probably you're going to see them flying around the sea cliff, uh, around the cliffs. And they are usually predating over either duck ducklings or even other seagulls. This is a bird that I really like. 
Tasta or Black Guillemot. You can see here that it's a little bit whitish. This is what is called the winter plumage. It's interesting because it looks like completely the opposite as the summer plumage, which is like more black with this white patch around the wing. Uh, the black guillemots are very interesting because of the sound they make. According to a very interesting tale from the Eskimos from Hudson Bay, they tell or they used to tell to their kids to not get close to the cliffs, otherwise they will become guillemots. And the reason for that is because apparently, according to their myths, a bunch of kids were playing, were fooling around the edge of the cliff, and they were disturbing a party of seal hunters. One of the seal hunters got really, really angry and started to shout at the kids that he wished that the cliff would collapse so they would be quiet. The cliff collapsed, the kids fell from the cliff, they died, and they became guillemots. So that's a, a warning for all the kids and for everybody to not get close to the cliffs because otherwise you will become a black guillemot and you will start to make this crazy sound that you can hear, uh, especially when you go to the intertidal area and you can see a lot of like, guillemots outside. And now it's a very good moment because you should get out and try to see them because they are in between the winter plumage and the summer plumage. Also, the black guillemot population is declining. We have around 10, 15,000 breeding pairs in the island, uh, but it's seen that the numbers are more or less stable right now. And of course, I cannot talk about birds without talking about puffins. We all know about puffins. These guys are going to be back very, very soon uh, in just a couple of weeks. In fact, the first uh, the first big flock has been detected, for example, in the Gibraltar Strait a couple of days ago, one week ago in Stockholm in uh, UK, uh, the first puffin arrived. And we all know that these guys are going to populate this beautiful island. Uh, what is interesting is to know a little bit more about the secret life of puffin. This uh, video that you can see here in the left side is uh, from a burro, from a puffin. Uh, it's uh, thanks to Naturostova Sudorlands, who is doing research of puffins for more than 10 years. And thanks that infrared cameras that we have, we can just get inside the burrows and we can know exactly if the puffins are doing well or not, if they have laid an egg, if the chick is surviving, that's how we can study puffins. Here you can see also in the left a puffling, what you all know probably if you've been participating in the puffling pattern, how the puffling looks like. And it's also interesting that these guys uh, are very specific birds. They have very specific diet. They like to eat a small schooling fish, like the one this guy is holding. The record is around 84 <laughs> small uh, sand deal in the big. So this guy, is, even though it looks like it has a lot, is far from that. And the problem is that uh, sand eel and other small schooling fish is decreasing, constantly decreasing. And especially here in the South, it's been recently published a paper that puffins have to invest a lot of time, a lot of effort to find fish. And more than 120 kilometers a day, they had to travel back and forth in order to go find fish. And because they cannot uh, keep it inside like other seabirds that later they would reduce state, these uh, puffins are directly giving the entire fish to their chicks, to the little puffins. Uh, they had to travel a lot. They had to go back and forth that consume a lot of energy. And of course, uh, that has a huge effect in the development of the chicks. Another species that I really like is the black leg kittiwake. The English version for this name is uh, not very thoughtful, let's say. It's called black leg because obviously if you see here in the right, it uh, has, right le has black legs. And it's called kittiwake because if you hear the sound, Exactly, it sounds like kitty way. There is a big colony of them just behind the gas station and one. And what's interesting about black lake kitty ways, they're one of the first arrivals after the winter. They are even, they are already here occupying the entire colony. Uh, what is interesting is that they lay two eggs, but within the 10 first day that they lay the eggs and the eggs have hatched, the chicks can commit what is called siblicide. That means that one of the chicks, usually the oldest one, will push the youngest one out of the nest. Yes, because they want, they compete for resources. So sometimes it might happen that you see two chicks and after a week, you only see one.
And of course, Fulmar, Northern Fulmar. We have to give the word of loyalty to these guys because Northern Fulmars, they stay the entire year around in Besmanayer. The biggest colony of Fulmars in Iceland are usually in Westfjord uh, because they can travel back and forth to Greenland when we have extremely good fishing grounds. And they have a very good olfactory system. If you look here at the big, they have like a tube over the beak, that's because they belong to the tube nose family. And these birds are also known as the storm birds. But we don't have only one species of Northern Fulmar or Fulmar in Iceland. Uh, during the winter time, we can see this gray morph, and it's called the blue morph, even though the color is a little bit more gray. And it's a visitor from, from Greenland and from Svalbard, from the Arctic. They are coming here to Iceland to spend the winter because apparently it's warm enough for them and they will move back to the north during the breeding season. What I really like about the Fulmars is that uh, it's very connected with the Arctic environment and it's connected with the goddess of the underworld, Setna. According to the tale from the Inuit, Setna was a very pretty woman with a lot of guys that were after her. A lot of guys want to marry her, but she rejected all of them. So one day, a very handsome guy arrived to the island where she was living with her father and make a proposition. And of course, she couldn't resist that and she went with the guy. When they arrived to the uh, island of this guy, she realized that it wasn't a man. In fact, it was a bird. It was a fulmer. So she was extremely, extremely disappointed. After a few months, her father went to visit her and she told her, she, he, she told him, and uh, how bad was her life, that she didn't like to stay with this uh, northern Fulmar that has tricked her. So her father decided to take her, so to take, to took her back. What happened is that these birds are well known as the uh, storm birds. They are doing very well when the weather is horrible. You can see them flying around. So according to the myth, the Fulmar followed the boat and the father was really scared because the storm was really intense. So he decided to sacrifice her daughter and throw her overboard. Sedna hold herself to the boat with one hand. And of course, uh, the father was really afraid and started to cut one finger at a time. So its finger, when it entered into contact with water, become dolphins, seals, and whales. And she sank and died, and then she became the goddess of the underworld. I know the Inuit and the Eskimo stories are not very nice and not that Disney proof, but that's how they got the connection they were doing in the old times with nature and how brutal and rude could be nature. And now I'm going with one of the smallest seabirds that we have in Iceland, the Lich Storm Petrel and the European Storm Petrel. In fact, Vesmanayans hold the only known place in Iceland where they are breeding. Uh, store petrol are easily found, for example, in Edley Bay, or if you go all the way up to Heimakletur. And if you listen, you can hear that during the night. These guys are also from the same family as the Northern Fulmars. They are also a tubular family. They have extremely good, uh, good olfactory system. And what is interesting about these guys is that they have a uh, night nocturnal behavior. They are like bats. They, you can only see them during the night. In fact, this video that was recorded by Bart Bercruz last year in Etley Day is during the night in late July. And you can see all these full mar all these petrels flying around. And what is interesting is that they like puffins nest in burrows and they only like one single egg per season. And this year we have discovered something interesting. Uh, thanks to Natura Stava Sudorland research, one of the petrels was stuck. And then we discovered the secret light of petrels. We knew we um, got a GPS tag pack from one of the petrels and we discovered the path that they are doing annually. So for example, this petrel that was retrieved to GPS stay a uh, couple of months during June, July, August around Iceland, and then it start all the way down to Africa. It started around October here near the Azores and, and Canary Island. Then it went all the way to the west coast of Africa, keep on going in November, here in the equator area, tropical area. I guess it's warmer here than in Iceland. And then spend the winter around the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, and then it came back. What is interesting is that around May, you see all these yellow dots here. 
It's uh, the area that is known as the Charlie Dips Fracture. That area is humongous. It's a really great big canyon that the Grand Canyon in the state is nothing compared to that. And we have a lot of food there, a lot of nutrient. Um, the major uh, fisheries are going the, are, are there as well. Uh, we also know that a lot of whales, a lot of dolphins, and of course, a lot of birds, including puffins, are going in that area. So it's interesting that the petrol, before stopping by in and uh, coming back into Iceland for the breeding season, they stop by in this place. And the last bird I want to, to talk about, we are going from the smallest, the petrel, to the biggest, the northern gannet. Believe it or not, there are only two colonies in Iceland that you can see northern gannets during the winter time. One is around Elde and the other is around Besmanaya. So we have the privilege to have northern gannets the whole year round. And you see there are only five colonies of northern gannets, five big colonies of northern gannets around the island. So we are lucky to have at least one of those just here with us. Northern gannets have a very interesting technique uh, to hunt for fish or to have something to eat. And it's called plant diving. Probably you have seen them hundreds of times that suddenly you see a lot of birds, a lot of splashes. And it's because they acquire this torpedo safe, the proper safe of the air the water at more than 100 kilometers per hour. And they try to find their fish. In fact, fishermen in the old times, they used to look at birds in order to find fish. And it's because depending on the time that the gannets stay under the water, they know exactly what kind of fish they were preying on. So they would prepare what kind of, uh, of nets or other, or they would prepare different techniques of fishing so they would know what kind of fish they are gonna get. And also this is the queen of the ocean because it's the, the largest seabird that we have in Iceland. It's uh, 1.8 meters of wingspan. It's a very long one. And uh, you just need to go to Storhofdi or even in the golf course and you are going to see them flying over and over, trying to scan the ocean. And they have also bifocal vision. So that means that they can see like us. That's what makes them excellent hunters when they are trying to get some fish. OK, that was all with the birds. I'm not going to bother you more. It's been <laughs> a little bit of time. But now I want to share with you a few thoughts, because of course I can be talking about birds forever. But I think it's also very important to talk a little bit about conservation. We have these amazing birds, this amazing biodiversity in this island. But there are also a lot of issues, global, regional, and also local, that these birds are facing. So I want to share that with you so you can give it a thought and see what you can do. Uh, what we know, for example, is that all the population of seabirds are declining. In just 60 years, we have detected that more than 70% of all the bird population have disappeared. So we have just 30% of what used to be less than 100 years ago. And that's that's alarming. We have a lot of reason to explain why um, these seabird population are declining. One of them, for example, is the relation with the fish, fishing industry. Uh, it's something called by cuts, the accidental cuts of non-targeted species. And for example, here in Iceland, uh, there was a study uh, to assess the bycatch. And during 40 years, they were assessing in the lamb sucker gill net fishery, what was the bycatch? What was the amount of animals that were taken accidentally? So they discovered that in just 40 years, and I repeat, just with the lamb sucker gill net fishery, which is just one kind of uh, technique, they uh, accidentally trapped almost 2,000 marine mammals, I mean, harbor porpoises, white pig dolphins, four different species of seals, and more than 5,000 sea birds. The problem with this kind of techniques, as many other, all the fishers, they have their own problems, is that, of course, uh, birds, like birds like gannets, like cormorants, uh, loons, are all of them divers, puffins, for example, or razor bill. So they will go where the fish is. And of course, fishermen are going where the fish is. Uh, for example, with the long life fisheries, it's estimated that uh, around 160,000 seabirds die every year because of the long life fisheries, because they are going for the bait and they get trapped in the hook and they die. In the gill nets, is uh, the most devastating one. Apparently, there are more than 400,000 deaths of seabirds related each year just because of that and of course the troll fish, the trolling fishers. Apart from the bycats, we have also a very local problem, which is oil spill. Probably you all hear about that last year, 
Uh, there was a, a lot of birds that were found dead in the beach or on the harbor, also all along the south coast. Uh, it's still under investigation. What was the cause of the oil spill? But uh, the problem when birds enter into contact with oil is that they are not waterproof anymore. The small air sacs that they have in between their feathers are not, uh, uh, the air is uh, going out. Basically, the water is coming in and they get wet. They might suffer hypothermia. And of course, if they cannot float, if they are not waterproof, they end up in the beach. And if someone is not taking care of them, unfortunately, they die. When they try to remove the oil by themselves, printing their feathers and trying to clean them, they ingest that oil and that in the digestive tract. And of course, that oil is poisonous and they might die. As an example, the eater ducks that were found last, last year, this langvia or common guillemot during the winter, as well as this red throat loon. And you can see the difference between an oil bear and a non oil bear. What is the solution for that? Be careful. Uh, vessel maintenance is very important. We all need to check that out. We all need to check that our boats are not leaking. Well, it's not only about the cargo vessels and the oil tankers that are passing by that they might release some ballast and in that ballast they might release some oil, but also we have to take care of that here in the island. So it's very important to have an eye open and if you detect a leak, act immediately to avoid this kind of situation. At uh, this, um, kind of event uh, seems to be quite frequent. What we could do as well is trying to organize an oil spill response team, try to get some funds, some money in order to uh, gather a good crew, veterinarians, people that know what they are doing and try to help these birds when they are um, end up in the beach and they are uh, showing some sign of uh, oil or getting a lot of oil on their feathers. And last but not least, plastic. Plastic is the big thing. We produce almost 300 million tons a year of plastic, and the first piece of plastic ever made is still existing in the planet. It's estimated by that around 8 to 14 million, to oh, 4 million tons, 8 to, 4, 8 to 10 million tons of plastic end up in the ocean every year, and that causes the death of around 1 million seabird every year. It's not only what is uh, thrown from the vessels, cargos, uh, cargo ship, cruise ships, uh, fisheries, but also what we throw from land. According to one very recent study, it just uh, been published one week ago, uh, around 80% of all the plastic coming from land and ending up in the ocean stay around the coastal areas. And that's uh, very important to realize because that plastic is not going anywhere. If you throw something in the water, it's coming back. Even if you do not recycle something, that coming back as well to you. And it's interesting in this publication, you can see here where is Iceland, that um, we can have between one kilo of plastic per kilometer of a beach, for example, to almost a million. The most contaminated areas are, of course, Africa and Southeast Asia. But here in the south of Iceland, we have a purple dot. That means that the south of Iceland is one of the main areas where plastic is ending up in this country. So we have to be aware of that. And we try. We have to try to do uh, what is called the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. That's very, very important. And of course, if you see something on the beach, try to take it, because otherwise, birds are going to eat that. Uh, as I say, around 1 million seabirds are dying because of plastic ingest ingestion. And of course, plastic is not very healthy, it's not very nutritious. The birds are eating that, they are feeding the chicks with that, and of course, they are dying. Also, what is interesting is that one of every three fish that we capture around the world have, feed, have plastic on it. And also, 88% of all of the sea surface have signs of microplastic. So that's something that we have to take action immediately because if not in 20 years, we are gonna have more plastic that fish. Uh, it's something, as I say, it's very uh, easy to try to reduce, try to buy less product with plastic, try to enforce your municipality to do something about that. Uh, so hopefully we can reduce all the marine debris, all the plastic, so we can give a chance to this bird that we all love. And enough of the brainwashing. Now I would like to share with you uh, where you can get more information if you are hooked 
with this uh, thing of the birds. Uh, we have our own group here in Besman Island. It's called Fuglari Besman Island. We are very modest, just 100 members, more or less. So if you see an oil bird, you can post it there. If you see an interesting species that you don't know which one it is, or maybe you know that it's a, a rare sighting, you can post it there. So we can all share uh, the passion and the knowledge from these tiny birds that we have around the island. If you want scientific information, of course, Naturus Tawas Sudurlands also has a Facebook page, which I encourage you to follow. So you can uh, get all the updates and all the latest news about all the publication and the Puffin Patrol, of course, Facebook page, which is very, very nice to see a lot of interesting videos. And every year at the end of the summer, it's very interesting to follow what's going on with the little puffins that are ending up in our town. So that's going to be all for my part. Uh, all of you who were listening or who were watching, thank you very much for being there so early in the morning, or even if you watch that later on uh, online. I would like to thank all of you. Takfir, thank you. Yinkuya, obrigado. And of course, thank you to the Multicultural Center and Safna Hus, the Library of Best Manager. We are going to try to make another talk, this time about wells. So if you're interested, stay uh, tuned and try to check all the Facebook update. Thank you very much.